So here we go with some sounds. We're gonna bay at the moon. Oh, oh, okay, bay at the moon, like a dog. Oh, oh my God, that was, that was great. Good work, wow, good audience. I can feel it tonight. Okay, now let's do a coyote. You know the coyotes are very popular in San Francisco. They're going after little dogs and babies. The coyote went after a baby, it's terrifying. So let's do some hungry coyotes in San Francisco. <laughs> oh my God, that's not, oh, I love that. No, no, that, nope, that's wonderful. Good, 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 good. Okay, we're not gonna do any of those sounds. But remember, anytime I call for a sound, just hop on in and join me and some physicality too. It all makes it happen. Okay, so here we go with Murder at Hetch Hetchy. I'm John Fisher. Oh. I'm Alex Huddled, and this is Free Solo, the greatest documentary of all time. I'm climbing up El Capitan without ropes in Yosemite Valley. Nobody's made all the way up without ropes. I'm the ultimate free solo. I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it because I'm going to win the Academy Award for Best Leading Actor in a Documentary. Yes, I am. Oh, oh. This is necessary because Yosemite's never had a movie. Until Free Solo in 2019, there was no movie for Yosemite. It's like the greatest place on earth. It has no movie. It had Star Trek V. Do you remember this movie? I mean, it, it was directed by William Shatner. It's the one that they let him direct and then never again. And it started out with somebody doing Free Solo, really, back in the 80s, up El Capitan. William Shatner. He was like, hey, you know, why crazy? That was the Yosemite movie. But this is it. This is it, Alex. Hello is going to give Yosemite its movie finally. Yes, I am. Yes, I'm going up. I'm going to take it up. I'm going to take it up. I'm going to take it up. I know what you want to see. I know what you really want to see. This is what you really want to see. Ah! Clap. That's what you want to see. You want to see this clap. Ah! I'm going to take it up. I'm going to take it up. I'm going to take it up. My husband, Michael. He gave me Yosemite. Yeah. You know, I loved hanging out in the woods when I was a kid, around my house, and going up Mount Taya, which is right next to my house. But I'd never really known Yosemite, the majesty of Yosemite. And about 20 years ago, my husband took me there. And the first hike we went on was up to Vernal Falls. It was magical. All the way up by that waterfall, hiking up those steep steps in the spring. The spray of the steps, it was incredible. I couldn't believe it. It was such a magical adventure. Right beside a huge waterfall. Another day, we went swimming in a mountain lake. Oh, it was divine. We just lay there without anybody else around us. Swimming makes swimming sounds at home. Yeah! Make water sounds. You make fish sounds. You make a whale sound. Oh, my son probably didn't do that. It was incredible. It was like a religious experience, truly. And that's transcendentalism, right? Finding God in nature. Of course, the great transcendentalists from the 19th century into the 20th century was a man named John Muir. He truly did find heaven in nature. And he made Yosemite. He was born in Scotland. In the Highlands, he was raised a Calvinist, a strict religious man he was. And at 13, his family emigrated to Wisconsin, and he found himself surrounded by nature. 43 acres owned by his family that he could run about in. I was just like that. I was just like John Muir, because I had nature in my backyard. I had had eight acres. My father had eight acres of redwood trees, and I'd go out and I'd run in the redwood trees, run, run at home, just with your feet, just pants, make little fists with your hands. I'm, 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 that's it, that's it, we're in the redwood trees. Sometimes I'd run naked, take your clothes off of your lung, run around naked, explore the redwood trees. It was wonderful. It freed me, and it freed John Muir. He loved being out in nature. For him, it was the ultimate religion nature. And when he came to San Francisco in 1868, he arrived on a ship. And he got on that ship. 
And the first thing he said was, where's nature? Take me to nature. I don't want San Francisco, I want nature. Take me to nature. He didn't even stay long. He immediately went up to Yosemite and there he saw it. Pillars, pillars rising into the sky. They're the pillars of the ultimate cathedral. Forget about Salisbury and Notre Dame. We don't need those. We have nature, God's cathedral, and the wind blowing in the trees. That is the psalms, the hymns to the wind, and home to the wind. Shh. That's it, yes. That's the congregation singing. Now it turned into, into sounds. Oh, yes, the ultimate. Cathedral is God's cathedral. I found it. And he had, he found it in Yosemite. It was a magical place. And he invited the biggest transcendentalist, Ralph Waldo Emerson, to come visit him there. And not that Waldo Emerson arrived, you were saying, well, we'll sleep outside, right? And the tent said, no, I'm, I'm going to sleep in a hotel room. Yeah, come and sleep in my hotel. Hotel! Muir was so disappointed. A hotel. But he worked hard. And it was a difficult time because there was a conservation movement going on in the second half of the 19th century, but it had two poles, two, two separate tracks. One was preservation. That meant what John Muir wanted, save everything, save it all, don't destroy anything. And then there was the wise use, the forestry approach. The ones are a resource. You can cut down a tree. You just don't cut down all of them. Cut down some of them. Then move over here and cut these down. And those go back. And then cut those. You know, use the resource. But Muir was successful at first in preservation, preserving. And he got, he said he turned into a national park in 1890. And I knew he worked with the Southern Pacific Railway. The Southern Pacific Railway. Yes. The locomotives do a train at home. Yeah, it's good. good. Do a steam whistle. Yeah, but the trains were the ultimate explorers, right? They were the ultimate destroyers. All that track, all that fog, all that feel. Yeah, Southern Pacific, but he worked with them. Not to lay track into Yosemite Valley and destroy it, but to get tourists to Yosemite Valley. The Southern Pacific helped him. And they done this in Yellowstone. And the way they got the tourists there was they hired a great American artist named Thomas Moran to paint these beautiful pictures of Yellowstone to attract the tourists. But you didn't need that for Yosemite because you already had in the 1860s, masterpieces painted by Bierstadt. Yes, this local artist, Jolie. Jolie Provost was inspired by Bierstadt who painted Yosemite. You have the ultimate marketing campaign right in place and the tourists came and he saved the valley from development. Then he all formed the Sierra Club, which was formed of faculty members from UC Berkeley and Stanford, and they would preserve the sanctity of America's national parks. And successful as he was, nevertheless, there were dark waters ahead, waters that maybe he wouldn't be able to navigate. John Muir. He was an outsider. He loved the outside. He loved his family. He loved to write. What would they be like to go outside and camp, live in the woods? And that made him the ultimate outsider. I was an outsider too. I grew up in a very nice little town, a rich town called Ross in Marin County. And Ross was very beautiful, but it was very tony, right? It was all about clubs. There was the golf club, and the racket club, and the bridge club. There was the Pacific Union Club that everybody was a member of in the city, St. Francis Yacht Club, the commercial club, the Bohemian Club, clubs, clubs, clubs. I didn't want that. I wanted to be different. That's probably why I discovered the woods, going out in the woods and running through the woods, running. Smell the sap, smell that beautiful redwood bark, rub it on your skin, it itches, the horse itches, itches yourself, scratch, scratch, scratch yourself. It's wonderful to be out in the woods. For me, it represented freedom, especially when I was running around naked. Run, run, enjoy the woods in your own home. It was incredible. And that was Muir's response to the woods also. He was free out of his woods. It brought freedom. In college, I felt like I had to fit in. It was time to grow up and fit in. All that made me do was become insular. I was closed off. I couldn't fit in with anybody, but I wouldn't let myself run around in the woods anymore. I was too old for that. 
So I became cut off. It's my husband, Michael, who I met in college. The best thing I ever got from college was Michael. His grades, we've been together forever. And he gave me back the outdoors. He liked to walk and run and hike and he liked to bike, bike everywhere. And during COVID-19, we went back. We went back to where I'd been when I grew up. Those woods, those woods where my house was on the side of Mount Tam. And we climbed Mount Tam because it was the only town. The only mountain we could get to was Mount Tam. We climbed all over the mountain. It freed us even during COVID. And when COVID lifted, it was time for Yosemite again. Oh, give me an ethereal awe, an ethereal awe. Are you ready? Oh, oh great. Oh, and the e ticket in 70 was half dome, that big half dome, that ear shaped dome at the end of the park, the highest point, 8,000 feet above sea level. Give me a high ah, ah, everybody, ah. We could do it. It was the e ticket of the 70. Hey, do you remember what the e ticket is, right? Well, okay, a lot of you do, but if you don't, yeah, when you used to go to Disneyland when I was a kid, they had these books and they had A, B, C, D, E tickets, right? And the A was like little teacups that spun around all the babies. But the E tickets, that was the Pirates of the Caribbean, the Matterhorn bobsleds, the Haunted Mansion. I loved it that it was a roller coaster in the Matterhorn, so they didn't call it like cars, they called it bobsleds. I thought that was so great. It was like your head smashed on this roller coaster. It was so terrifying. Those were the E tickets and that. That would be half done for us. But how can we do it? How can we go up it? Because there was a lottery. You had to enter a lottery to get a pass to go up because it got so crowded near the top on the chains, they call them these big chains at the top. It got so crowded over the years that they had a lottery. And we kept striking out on the lottery. It never worked out. Well, we decided to go to Yosemite anyway. We'd climb up Yosemite Falls and we were there. And the day we climbed up Yosemite Falls, my husband had entered a last minute cancellation app and he got a cancellation on Half Dome. So we found out the next day we'd be headed up Half Dome. Yay! 13 miles, almost straight up. We wouldn't be climbing, but it'd be the toughest hiking we'd ever done and the longest. Could we do it? Could we do 13 hours of hiking? Was it possible? It was the ultimate challenge. If we could do it, it'd be the best way to come out of COVID. John Muir had his own challenges. See, the problem was at the end of the 19th century, going into the 20th century, was that the battle between forestry and preservation. Forestry wanted to utilize the forests, not destroy them, but husband the resource, conserve it, and use it for the benefit of the people. Preservation just wanted to save it, make it work. And John Muir started out working with the forestry people, most prominently a man named Gifford Pinchot. Gifford Pinchot was Yale educated. He'd studied forestry in Europe for years, familiar with stuff. He was very, very interested in preserving the forests, but for use. Now, at first they worked together, but then Muir decided he didn't feel comfortable with this. He even wrote some papers promoting forestry, but then he didn't feel comfortable with it. Trees were getting cut down. It's like, you know, cutting down children and then saying more will come back later. It didn't make sense to him. And on top of that, he didn't get along with Gifford Pinchot because Pinchot was in the sheep. Pinchot thought the sheep should be able to wander around and eat in the forest, just eat whatever they could find, make uh, sheep sounds. <laughs> That's good, good, good. Now, ba and e. Pretty good, pretty good. No, oh, that's better. You're getting better. Duh, duh, duh. Oh, my God. You are hated sheep. You thought they were vermin. You thought they were rats. They couldn't eat the trees. They couldn't eat the redwoods and the squirrels, but they could eat everything else. He thought they would destroy the woods. So that was his big break with Pinchot. Now, the problem with Pinchot was he was male educated, so he was part of that old boys team, right? The Ivy League. Muir didn't even have a college degree, but he was charismatic. Yes, and a person who was drawn to him, to his ideas, was President Theodore Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt ducked out of the Secret Service, if you can imagine, and spent three days camping with John Muir in Yosemite, in a tent, in a snowstorm they camp. Makes you want to sense. Really loud. This is Teddy Roosevelt. Really loud. In the morning, four inches of snow had fallen, and Teddy Roosevelt got up. He wiped the snow off, and he said, what did he say? 
That's right. Boring. Boring. It's boring. Yosemite is boring, boring. And then he wanted to go hunting. <laughs> well, John Muir was having none of that. He said, Mr. President, do you really need to prove yourself by shooting helpless animals? Do you think that's right? And the president actually said to him, you're right, it's wrong. Burn, say some bullies at home. Yes, yeah, so, that was good, you guys. Oh, you're up on Teddy Roosevelt. Good. So we had the support of Teddy Roosevelt. And as a result, the assembly was expanded. The park was expanded to include the incredible valley that we have today with all those incredible prominences. And also the valley just north of it, the valley called Hetch Hetchy. And then John Muir convinced him to turn the Grand Canyon into a national park. That relationship was working. He was influencing politics. He was changing the country. And he was popular, John Muir. He was winning. And our ascent of Haptum would be our tribute to him. It would be our celebration of John Muir. Now, okay, so I have some uh, climbing strategies. Okay, these are strategies for successful climbing. So uh, help me out here. I'm gonna ask for some sounds. Okay, first of all, get to bed early. Okay, you're gonna need eight hours sleep before this. All right, okay, so sleep, give me some story. It doesn't have to be Teddy Roosevelt stories. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Get up early, get up early. Give me an alarm clock. That's good. Mm -hmm. And hit the trail early. Why? Why? Because you want to get as far as possible on the trail before the sun comes up because it's going to be murder. Also, bring lots of water, more than you want to carry. You should be struggling with carrying so much water because you're going to need it. Now, as you're hiking, you should always hydrate, even when you're watching the show. Hydrate, drink something. Not a cocktail. That's the opposite. Bring water. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Juice is good. No, no, milk. Those are all good things. Cocktails. Cocktails are for the weekend. So uh, uh, you should always drink lots of water. Now, you're hiking on this hike up Half Dome by the Merced River. Don't drink it. It's full of microbes and bacteria. You're going to end up with a bowel shattering experience. It is going to be so painful. Your butt's going to turn into the most vicious plane thrower of all time. Ah! There's jarry in that water. It will get you, get you, get you. OK, so now we have our strategies. Let's do it. Let's ascend half dome. Okay, so um, I'm just gonna get some instruments here to show you. Okay, so if you have a guitar at home, get your guitar or a drum. Anything that will work as a drum. Let's do just some examples. So here we go. Okay, now what we're gonna do is uh, we have to create a rhythm for this ascent. Boom, boom, boom. So if it's your guitar, you can just go. And then uh, you can do a drum, okay? Or you can just clap. All right, okay? So let's practice, let's set a rhythm. Okay, so here we go. And boom, 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 and keep it going, okay? Just keep it going. It doesn't have to be too loud, right? I want you to be able to follow the story and participate, but just keep it going. Boom, boom, da -dum, da -dum, boom, boom. Okay, so here we go on our ascent. Up half to so we're sleeping. We've gotten our eight hours of sleep. Boom, boom, boom. Give me an alarm clock. Okay, oh, we're up, we're up, we're up. Okay, we have to hit the trail before the sun comes up. First thing we hit is Vernal Falls. Remember that? Okay, those steep, steep stairs. We're ascending up Vernal Falls. That's it. Keep the rhythm coming. Keep the rhythm coming. Don't sit. Don't speed up. Don't speed up. 7.30, we're going to go up to the battle falls. Yes. Struggle. Keep the rhythm coming. Keep the rhythm coming. Don't speed up yet. Don't speed up yet. 9 a.m. The sun comes up. Ah! No, we've got our hats. Put that hat on. Put that hat on. Drink some of that water. Now we're going to ascend. Now we're on the switchbacks. Switchbacks are terrible. All oh, you do with switchbacks is not get anywhere. You put about this far, but it's like, it takes forever to switch back. All they do is worry about it. the sun speaking down on you. But it's beautiful. But the sun's being down on you, but it's beautiful. We're doing the switchbacks. Keep the rhythm going. Now speed up a little bit. Speed up the rhythm. Speed up the rhythm. We're on. 
the sanctum. Ah, massive granite steps. And this whole world is about this height. And we go up the sanctum. And now it's time for the chains, the horrifying chains. There's a huge pile of gloves on the ground. You have to pick up a glove and put it on. Gloves on both hands as you're going to go up the chains. Okay, pick up the rhythm. The rhythm should be like. <coughs> and here we go up, up the chains. <sighs> 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 It's almost straight up. It's like going straight up the face of a rock. And in front of you, the person in front of you, their butt is in your face. And your butt is in somebody else's face. Have your war clean them to work. And we're going up. Oh, 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 we're on top of Half Dome and we're looking down. Oh my God. We're looking straight down, down 8,000 feet. Take too far. You have no oxygen. You can't breathe. Your head is spinning. It's crazy up there. People aren't thinking right. They're like wandering right on the edge. You want to say, stop, stop. When we went, there was a little tiny baby who descended on his father's back. And the little baby kept walking near the edge. <laughs> and then somebody would stop him and turn around. And then he'd go back. <laughs> Babies are suicidal. <laughs> and just before you I'd do some baby sounds. Yeah, no, it's good, good. Are there some babies watching? That was very authentic. I think there's some babies out there. Oh, adult babies. Good. I love it. I hope you're wearing diapers. Okay, here we go. <laughs> and there's stuff and stuff. And then everybody's taking these pictures. Everybody's on top of this. There's like this little wedge that's like 8,000 feet above Yosemite Valley. And everybody just went out of this little wedge to take pictures. And the stupidest things are like, ah, 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 ah. It's like insane. And my husband Mike goes up there with me. And I'm like, standing in front of him. Like, don't, don't go near that edge. Just stay behind me. If you pass in front of me, I will tackle you and bring you down. I don't want you anywhere near that edge. I mean, his mother would kill me if anything happened to him. Oh, I can think it's just going to fall. It's going to fall. You can stop the rhythm. And people do fall. It's interesting, though, because they don't fall off the face of half them. They fall off the chains. This chain is just went out. Why? Those are safety chains. I mean, <laughs> it's terrifying. What? But they are safe. At least you think they are. So why do people fall? Recently, a 29 year old woman fell 500 feet off the chains. 500 feet. She was dead before Airbag could come to help her. And then a man was trying to get up there faster than he should have. He was passing people, hustling past them on the chains. He lost his footing when he fell. Another man went up in the rain. They said, don't go up in the rain. Don't go up in the rain. It's too slippery. And he slipped and he fell. Both of those men died. And when we were up there, we could see a thunder shower in the distance. We could see lightning coming towards us. What would happen if we got up there? And the lightning struck and we couldn't get back. What if the lightning hit us? What if the whole thing got wet and we slipped? It's horrifying up there. You know, the park service was so concerned about all this that they they instituted the lottery. There were thousands of people going up every day, and now they've limited it to hundreds. They thought that would solve it. Did it solve it? No, it didn't. People are still dying. Why? Because people do stupid things. There's very little oxygen. You're not thinking right. You're exhausted. Your body is overwhelmed. You're not making good decisions. You're behaving foolishly in some instances. A lot of people probably should never go to the top because they're not responsible for their actions up there. Foolish behavior can happen at all 
stops along the way. At the top of Purple Falls, when we first descended, there's this beautiful lake. And everybody wants to swim in this beautiful lake. It's just like this painting over here, right? Everybody wants to swim in the lake. Right, at the top of Vernal Falls. They're so hot from the ascent. Why not? Why not take a swim in the lake? Because there's all these signs that say, don't swim in the lake, don't go in the water. It's dangerous, there's current. You see, even in this picture, you see water flowing in this side, coming down the hill. Well, over here, there's that waterfall, Vernal Falls, 350 feet, and if people go in the lake, they can be sucked into the falls by the current. In 2011, a man named Yarub was up there with his family. One of the younger members of the family, a young woman went out into the water because she wanted to get onto a little island for a photo opportunity. She slipped on the way out and she started being drawn towards the waterfall. Yakub went to her to reach and grab her hand. He slipped too into the water. And now he was headed towards the waterfall. And then another member of the family went to help him and slipped and fell and all three of them were in the water, struggling against the water, struggling to get back to the shore. They couldn't, the current was too strong. And then they clung together, holding each other, trying to get away from the waterfall, and they couldn't. And the looks on their faces, according to everybody up there who saw that with their mouths hanging open, their looks were pure horror. And the clump of them clinging to each other, horrified, went over the falls. Somebody walking up in the mist, like we did, they actually saw in the waterfall a head popping out going down 350 feet onto the rocks. They were mulched. No bodies were ever recovered. It's not just stupidity or foolishness that brings about tragedy in the park. There've been murders, mass murders. Men in carry Skanum. He killed three women. A woman named Carol Sand, her daughter, and her daughter's best friend. They were up there to have a happy, fun week at Yosemite. They were staying at this little lodge, and he was the handyman. And one night he came by, they were in their cabin, and he said he wanted to fix their, he knocked on the door, and he said he wanted to fix their, uh, the sink in their bathroom. They, they said, we're not going to let you in. And he said, no, no, it's, your sink's not working. I just want to fix it. And they're like, no, we're not going to let you in. He said, okay, I understand. I'm gonna go tell the manager to move you to another room and then I'll go in and fix it. And they said, oh, okay, we've seen this guy around. He is the handyman, we do know that. So it must be okay, right? So they let him in, he went into the bathroom, he pulled out a gun and he came out of the bathroom and he pulled it out. He tied up the two young women on the bed. He took Carol Sand, the mother, into the bathroom and slit her throat. The young women on the bed didn't know that this has happened because they've been bound and gagged and blindfolded. They didn't hear anything happen. He came out and took another one of them. He separated them. He cut their clothing off with scissors so they're both naked. And he took the daughter, Carol Sand, into the bathroom and slit her throat, killed her. Then he put both those bodies into the trunk of his car without the other girl even knowing what was going on. He put that girl into the car and he drove out of Yosemite Valley. She didn't even know the bodies were active. She didn't know that anybody had died. He took her out of Yosemite Valley down to Lake Don Pedro. He went out onto a little peninsula with her. He was going to rape her. He set her down on the ground on her knees. He put his hands on, his, on her shoulders. He was going to rape her. She was shaking. She started to struggle. He whispered in her ear, I love you. And then he slit her throat. How do we know all this? He confessed it all. He told it to the police. And then he gave a radio interview where he repeated it all. He was never found. He sent a letter to the police saying, I had fun with those guys. And a map of where the body would be found. And they could not figure out who it was. He'd watched so many detective shows on TV, real crime shows. He knew how to commit the crime and how to cover his tracks. A few weeks later, he managed to get into the room of another young lady. Her name was Joy Armstrong. She was a student studying geology at Yosemite. He got in there, he pulled a gun on her and tied her up. And she really knew who this was because they'd been hunting for him for weeks. 
She was horrified. He put her into the car. He was going to take her out in the woods and rape her. He left the window down. She jumped out the window of the moving car and ran into the woods. He chased her. He tackled her. And then he slit her throat. He cut her head off and threw it into the center. It was found 50 yards from her body downstream. What had happened to him? What had brought this on? Well, one thing was, is he was the brother of Stephen Stainer. Stephen Stainer was a little boy who in the 70s had been abducted by a man, a fully grown man who was seven years old. And for eight years, he was held in captivity and raped repeatedly. He was raped 3,000 times. When he was 15, he escaped. He felt like he had to escape because the man was looking for a younger boy to replace him. He managed to talk the man out of kidnapping another boy. He managed to prevent that from happening, and then he escaped and got back to his parents. I remember watching on TV a TV movie called, called I Know My Name Is Stephen, about this little boy. But the most heartbreaking scene is when he's home finally with his parents, and his father won't talk to him because his father is humiliated that his son had been raped 3,000 times. His brother was Carrie Stainer, who was the one who committed these atrocities. This is the world he grew up in. And also he was jealous because the kid got so much attention. He was confused about how you get attention. His brother got so much attention and everybody ignored him. And also, even before any of this happened, he'd had violent fantasies. So the 80s, the 90s, up until 2000, when all this happened, he'd been fantasizing about killing people. Why? Because he said when he killed those four women, he finally felt like he was in control. What does this have to do with Yosemite? Because that's exactly what John Muir found in Yosemite. Freedom! That's what it gave him, freedom. But with freedom came responsibility. Freedom encourages people and it empowers people to perhaps make stupid decisions, foolish decisions, even by much criminal decisions. It's the danger of Yosemite, the lure of it. What's the park service done? Have they put up walls on Half Dome? Do they have FBI agents crawling over? They said, no. People are responsible for themselves. If they come here, they must be responsible for themselves. Wilderness comes with great dangers, great risks. You feel that in the center. You see the potential for danger. And you realize how isolated you are, how things could happen to you. Crime, because you're out there in the middle of nowhere. You really have escaped, gotten somewhere else. It wasn't just tragedy in hard time, but tragedy in John Muir's time. The next valley over, the next valley north from the 70s is called Hetch Hetchy. It's still there. Hetch Hetchy is the indigenous word for wild grasses. That's right. Do the wild grasses, blow them in the wind for me. It was beautiful. The huge soaring monoliths, just like Yosemite, with the beautiful valley below. It was spectacular. Unfortunately, in 1906, there was a horrible earthquake in San Francisco, as you know, and the water system failed. They couldn't put the virus out. Now, this had a lot to do with water management in the city. It wasn't really about lack of water, it was about water management. But San Francisco became desperate. It had always been looking for more water, and now we needed a ton more. And so it had a great argument for finding water. Where did they find water? 159 miles outside of San Francisco city limits at Hatch Hatchet, the Tuolumne River. If you dammed Hatch Hatchet, it would create an incredible reservoir. Immediately, people said, no, no, you can't do that. You can't dam Hatch Hatchy. It's in the middle of a national park. It's part of your 70 National Park. You can't take the water out of it. You can't dam that thing. It's impossible. Damn Hatch Hatchy. If you damned Hatch Hatchy, John Muir said, you're truly damn it. My God, you might as well damn a cathedral, damn a church, fill that huge dam and store the water in a church. It's outrageous. Well, Teddy Roosevelt agreed with him. We prevented Hetch Hetchy from being damned, and Congress supported Teddy Roosevelt. A Southern senator said, no, these people don't want to build a dam. A bunch of short-haired women and long-haired men. Boom. And President Taft 
continued to prevent the dam from being built. And John Muir raised, it's the money lenders, it's the money lenders coming back into the valley, into the temple. I Christ, they're gonna drive those money changers out, out of the temple. That's how he saw himself. And then the Wilson administration, Woodrow Wilson. And his director of forestry, his forestry chief was none other than Guilford Pinchot. Remember Yale educated, the Princeton educated President Wilson while they were a team and they saw it the same way. And Gifford Pinchot gave a speech to Congress talking about the benefits of Hachachi and what it would bring to the city and bring to the nation. He talks about how incredible it would be. It was the best place to build a dam. It was so simple to build it there. And there were other locations like Lake Don Pedro, but he said, no, 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 that won't work as well. This is better, it'll hold more water. It'll be easier to dam. And he said, it will be a vacation destination. Think how beautiful that reservoir is gonna be reflecting all those beautiful mountains in the water, the trees, everything will be right there. And you'll be able to drive all the way around this reservoir and these huge roads to look at. There'll be boating, boating docks, ferry boats on the water. There'll be hotels, cabins. It'll be better than Yosemite. You'll have pristine Yosemite and this beautiful reservoir right next to it. People will flock to both. He made a very persuasive argument and he felt most strongly that we have to use our resources. We have to use the things we've got to develop. He found an ally, a man named William Kent, a new member of Congress about this time, 1910, 1911. William Kent was from Marine County. You remember his name from some Marine County places, Kent Field, Kent Woodlands. Uh, Kent Reservoir. Yes, that William Kent. The Kent Estate. And William Kent was actually a big friend of John Muir. They were like this. And he so admired John Muir that he gave a huge tract of land on Mount Tamil Pius to John Muir. Muir Woods. And that had first growth redwoods. Those big, thick, thousand year old redwoods. Not second growth, not third growth, first growth. And they're still there. That's how much William Kent admired John Muir. But William Kent believed in the dam. He believed in the dam because he was afraid that PG&E was going to take control of San Francisco. And PG&E took control of San Francisco, San Francisco would be lost to corporate interests. So what was he going to do? He was going to give San Francisco power by giving it water and hydroelectricity that would come from this dam. He was going to empower San Francisco. And when John Muir railed against him, he said, John Muir doesn't know anything. He's been hanging out in the wood too long. So, Kent yeah, also lay down with Gifford Pinchot. They pat each other's backs, they helped each other out. So William Kent in Congress would help Gifford Pinchot get this dam built if Gifford Pinchot would help William Kent turn Mount Tamil Pius, my mountain, into a state park. And he did. That's why I got a state park where I could climb and run the redwood trees because of this collaboration between William Kent and Gifford Pinchot. Unfortunately, the Piper wanted to be paid. And now it was time to build that dam. And it was incredibly controversial. And it went before Congress. And so the race to get the dam approved by the government started. The race to build a dam in a national park. So first it went to Congress. It was a big debate. Not everyone was for this. No one didn't pass, but in past Congress, the dam was going to be built. And now it had to be approved by the Senate. Now would the Senate approve it? Thousands of people suddenly concerned about preservation, wanting to maintain this beautiful valley, wrote to their senators. A senator in Missouri received 5,000 letters from concerned citizens. The newspapers were all against the dam. The New York Times, they railed against the dam. They said, this is ridiculous. We've got to prove to Europe that we have a culture. The Europeans think we're Philistines. Can't we show them with this that we believe in nature? that we can preserve things. Also, there are other opportunities, there are other places to get the water. This isn't necessary, but the Senate wasn't listening to the people or to the newspapers. The Senate was listening to itself. The old boys club, things worked backstairs, lobbyists, people like Gifford Pinchot from Yale, the Ivy League, and the Senate came into vote, and on the day they came into vote, all of their desks had two things on them, a huge copy of the San Francisco Examiner, which talked about all the benefits 
all the money, all the power that this dam would bring to San Francisco and a big red leather volume which when you opened it showed what a beautiful vacation spot it would be. The roads with the cars looking at the reservoir, the boats, the ferries, the hikes, the hotels. It seemed like the perfect solution to build the dam, both for the people, for the city, for the vacationers, the tourists, everybody. So the Senate approved it. And now it was on President Wilson's desk. It was on Woodrow Wilson's desk and John Neal, went to see President Wilson. And he said to President Wilson, he said, this is the time. You need to be courageous. Courage, Mr. President, courage. Defy Congress. Don't build this dam, it's evil. It is God's country and you must not destroy it. John Lee was very persuasive and as he was leaving, his heart sank because he saw him sitting there waiting to talk to the president, William Kent, who then entered the president's office right after John Muir left. And so the dam was built. And the dam cut off the beautiful valley full of hachachi, full of wild grasses. What was the end result? A beautiful valley destroyed, but it had activated Americans. Now they were aware that they could fight against anybody to prevent the disloyation, the destruction of the national parks. And they would. There would never be another dam built in the national park because people would fight back. The Sierra Club, citizens, they would fight, they would write, they would demand that these kinds of things would not happen again, and they have. So, in a way, a tragedy, but a success story. Unfortunately, it also broke John Muir's heart. His beautiful Yosemite National Park to spoil, Hatch Hatchy Lost. The Raker Act was signed by President Wilson in 1913. John Muir, a broken man, died in 1914. He'd accomplished so much but he couldn't reconcile that one of his favorite valleys in the world, the sister valley to Yosemite, he called it, had been destroyed. When we were coming back from a big hike up Half Dome, we were so victorious. When we got down, we had pizzas and Cokes. We were so ecstatic. We ate junk food to celebrate. The next day, driving home, we decided to pull over and look at Hetch Hetchy. We pulled off the road. And we drove down the road to Hetch Hetchy. Give me some moments, some motor sounds. Like, yeah, like an old car, like, like an old style car, like 30s, like when the tourists started going. Yeah, yeah that's good. Good, 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 good. And we're driving down this little road. It was almost it's like barely paved. And we could only go about 20 miles an hour because it was so skinny. And then we rounded a corner, and there it was O'Shaughnessy Dam, Hetch Hetchy with a big dam in the middle of it. It was really, really interesting looking, right? There was this big reservoir behind it, but this road was so tiny and we didn't see anybody else on this road. And we were just flying down this road. And finally, we got to the dam. We got out of the car. There were very few parking spaces. There's almost nobody out there, like 10 other people. There's no camping, no hotels. You couldn't drive around the lake. It was, it wasn't, no, you couldn't do it. All you could do is hike on one side. There's no boating. There were no ferries, restaurants, nothing, no infrastructure. It wasn't at all like Yosemite. And we walked out of the dam and we looked out across the water. They never built all that stuff. Nothing. Yeah, there are campers and hikers, but only really serious people. The masses had not come. And who could come over that little windy road? And the whole feeling was is they didn't really want you there. They didn't want you near this valuable water that San Franciscans needed to drink. Stay away from it. That seemed to be the spirit. My husband Michael and I we walked out there, having just come from Yosemite. And we stood on the dam and we looked out across those waters. And we imagined the Hetch Hetchies. The green grasses waving, but not in the wind anymore. Now 300 feet underwater, 
where they couldn't be enjoyed, where they were probably gone, lost in a sea of mud. That touchy story isn't over. In 2012, there was a proposition, Proposition F, that San Francisco's got to vote on. Should we restore Hatch Hatchy? Should we knock down the dam and turn it back into a nature paradise? Turn it back into what John Muir always said it would be, what the photographs showed us it could be, a masterpiece of nature. 2012, and all we had to do was vote on a feasibility study that would cost $8 million. But San Franciscans, they love their water. They're very proud of their Hetch Hetchy water. It's not filtered. We don't even filter our water. It's so pure. It's the best water in the world. San Franciscans rejected Proposition F. They wouldn't even pay for a feasibility study because they didn't want to lose their water. Why? Because it's cheap. We don't filter this water because it's so pure. We don't even need to. And we save a lot of money. But we're also wasteful. We waste the water. We use it for toilets and gardening. Other cities, they recycle. They have much better water management. But San Franciscans didn't want to pay for proper water management. Were there alternatives? Yes, of course. There's this huge alternative right below Hachachi. Lake Don Pedro. It's just waiting for water. Of course, they have to fix it. They have to build it out. And it costs billions of dollars for them to it. There'd be two Yosemites, and eventually they'd both be making a lot of money. We could have done something right. It's happened in other parts of the country. Dams have been brought down, knocked down, restored. And nature does come back. And they say it's going to take decades. We wouldn't see it in our lifetime. We don't care about maybe it's not going to happen in our lifetime, but we would. Even if we want to be cynical about it, we need to see something right away. We would. We would see something right away in Hatch Hatch there's an organization called Restore Hatch Hatchy, and it's still fighting for all this. It's still fighting to bring down that dam, to restore Hatch Hatchy. And I can't help but think, in the midst of COVID, this sort of natural disaster and fire is burning and heat everywhere, or the polar ice caps melting, can't we, in the midst of all this deprivation, restore something? Wouldn't that be magical? to give this city back another playground, another temple, as John Muir saw it. We came out of COVID, and there it was, Yosemite, for us to enjoy, just like Mount Tamapias State Park, the result of that big compromise. Could we find it ourselves to maybe bring back Hatch Hatchy? So it was a murder mystery. I know. Who got killed? What's the mystery? The murder at Hetch Hetchy. It was Hetch Hetchy itself. And that big, huge dam rising like a monk, like a god. America and its dams. Let's control the world. You know, we're controlling it all night. Yeah. But this might be an opportunity to restore the world. I'll leave you with that thought. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm John Fisher, and this has been Murder at Hatch Hatchy. I do recommend going to Hatch Hatchy. It's kind of magical because it's so peaceful. And we did walk along the trail a little bit. There's some incredible waterfalls, dangerous ones apparently. People have been washed off of the shore in these waterfalls and drowned. So Hatch Hatchy has its own dangers. And you can still hear podcasts. The Restore Hetch Hetch is this incredible organization. They're still at it. They're still doing studies and trying to get it back on the ballot. And the cynics say, no way. I was shocked at the Chronicle. It was so vociferous in 2012. They say, no, 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 we don't want this. We don't want this. I said, why not? What's $8 million? It's just a feasibility study. Come on, but you know how it works. Once there's a feasibility study, I just spend another billion making it happen. I'd love to see that. And I know I'd be giving up the water, but uh, you know, we'll have Lake Don Pedro water. That sounds kind of fun, doesn't it? <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me. This is the Essential Services Project. I'm right here with David Wilson, who's my director of photography and co-director. So let's give him a round of applause. David has helped me so much with these projects. Yay! <laughs>